For hundreds of years, everyone who came to Rome, from emperors marching in triumph, to pilgrims shuffling along in the dust, entered through the Porta del Popolo, which today opens into one of the city's largest squares, the Piazza del Popolo, which boasts the largest obelisk in Rome. This 75-foot-high pillar was brought from Egypt in 10 BC and placed in the Circus Maximus. Later, it was moved here. Romans use their piazzas as sort of outdoor living rooms. Here, they meet friends, watch their children play, sit down for a quiet read, and generally just enjoy their wonderful city. The Piazza di Spagna got its name in the 17th century because the Spanish ambassador took up residence here in the Palazzo di Spagna. The whole area was subsequently declared Spanish territory and foreigners who passed through at night were often shanghaied into the Spanish army, never to be seen again. At the northern end of the piazza are the famed Spanish steps. Here, you're likely to find just about every kind of street life. Clerics rushing off to mass. Beautiful young girls enjoying a free afternoon. Salesmen selling roasted chestnuts or kitschy souvenirs. caricaturists, solitary readers, struggling artists, and a lot of tired sightseers resting their feet before heading up the steps to the church of Trinità dei Monti. If Venice is the city of canals, and Verona the city of balconies, then surely Rome is the city of fountains. And of all the fountains in Rome, the best known is the Fontana di Trevi, the Trevi Fountain. It was made famous in the films Three Coins in the Fountain and La Dolce Vita. It is visited by everyone who comes to Rome. This is a great place to relax to the soothing sound of the water and watch the world go by. It was Pope Clement XII who commissioned Nicola Salvi to create the fountain. Salvi died before it was finished but not before putting up a large urn to obstruct the shop of the local barber, who had made rude remarks about the fountain during its construction. For generations, visitors have thrown coins into the fountain to ensure their return to Rome. However, legend has it that you must throw two coins, the first so you'll come back, and the second over your shoulder to make a wish come true. If the typical Roman could get his wish, he'd probably have this place moved out into the suburbs somewhere. Dubbed the typewriter and the wedding cake by the locals, it's the Vittorio Emanuele Monument, built in 1901 to commemorate the unification of Italy. The tomb of Italy's unknown soldier lies inside. The nearby forums of Caesar, Nerva, and Augustus can be seen today thanks to Mussolini, who bulldozed a boulevard, the Via dei Fori Imperiali, through an ancient quarter, so he could have a view of the Colosseum from his balcony in the Palazzo Venezia.
You can't really blame him for wanting a view of this, the most famous site in all of Rome. Built in 72 AD by the Emperor Vespasian and completed in 80 AD by his son Titus, the Colosseum was the scene of spectacles unlike any other. Hundreds of gladiators slaughtered thousands of wild animals here. But historians doubt that Christians were actually thrown to the lions. Today, echoes of the past reverberate in the brilliant sunshine. With imagination, one can still hear the shouts of the crowd, urging the emperor to give his thumbs up or thumbs down sign to determine whether a gladiator would live or die. A giant awning operated by sailors brought here from the Adriatic port of Ravenna, especially for the purpose, kept out the sun and rain. A wooden floor, which could be flooded for the staging of mock naval battles, covered the basement cells visible today. Using the 80 entrances, as many as 50,000 spectators could take their places in just 10 minutes. And seating was carefully regulated according to rank. Spectators are still coming today from all over the old empire and from places unknown during ancient times. Rome is a jumble of different architectural styles today, but during classical times, the Greek influence was most strongly felt. The Romans borrowed their columns from the Greeks, making a few modifications of their own here and there. They were innovators, however, when it came to vaulting. They perfected the use of arches and particularly domes. The most famous dome is that of the Pantheon, the only perfectly preserved ancient building in Rome. Originally a pagan temple built by Agrippa in 27 BC, it was completely redesigned by the Emperor Hadrian, famed as an innovative architect of his time. The Pantheon has been called the single most perfect building in the world, mainly because of its simplicity. The building has only two spatial elements, and both are in perfect harmony, the dome and the rectangle supporting it, and proportion. The diameter of the building is exactly equal to its overall height of 142 feet. The dome was originally gilded with bronze inside and out, but the tiles that originally covered the roof were pulled off by the Eastern Emperor Constantinus II for the decoration of Constantinople. And the bronze beams under the porch roof were melted down by Pope Urban VIII for the Baldacchino in St. Peter's. The original bronze doors, however, have survived. The best time to visit the Pantheon is during a thunderstorm, when rain pours in through the hole in the ceiling and lightning flashes illuminate the interior. The painter Raphael and the first king of Italy, Vittorio Emanuele II, are among the notables entombed here. Vast underground galleries, the catacombs are believed to stretch more than 500 miles under the countryside around Rome. Christians were first buried here when it was against the law to bury anyone within the city walls. Later, the burial grounds became a shrine, a place where Christians could gather and worship together. Vertical layers of labyrinthine passages cut into the soft rock below ground contain the tombs of tens of thousands of Christians of the third and fourth centuries. At least five popes are buried in the catacombs. Whole loads of remains were carted off in ancient times to sanctify churches built on the sites of pagan temples and bones from the catacombs were sold all over Europe to Christians who wanted to possess a saintly relic. The Aurelian Wall once surrounded all of Rome. 
It was built during the last years of the empire to safeguard the formerly invincible city, a time when the decline and fall of Rome was already beginning. But despite the Vandals and the Visigoths, the Huns and the Barbarians, life in Rome went on, and it goes on today in ways grand and simple. No. Bocce, Italian bowling, is a passion that is easily acquired. The object is to get your ball as close to the little ball as possible. What could be easier? But don't be fooled. It takes great concentration. The Bocca della Verità was carved as a giant theatrical mask to cover a drain. Legend has it that if a liar put his hand in the mouth, it would be chopped off. Some say a priest with a wooden cane would sometimes stand behind the mouth and swat the hands of people he knew to be lying. Mothers still bring their children for the test, and suspicious wives bring their husbands. There is no record of any hands being lost yet. Tiber Island was always known to the Romans as a place of healing. In 293 BC, the Roman Senate, faced with a terrible plague, sent a delegation to Greece to consult the priests of the medical god Esculapius. On their return to Rome, the miracle dispensing snake they were bringing back plunged overboard as their ship came abreast of Tiber Island. Where the snake landed, the temple of Esculapius was built, and there it stood, serving as a hospital for centuries. Located on the river's left bank, Trastevere is one of Rome's oldest districts and has changed little over the centuries. It is a rabbit warren of little streets and small squares, roof gardens and leafy terraces. Today, the home of artists and bohemians, Trastevere was originally a seaman's quarter where the sailors who worked the giant awning of the Colosseum lived. This is the Church of St. Cecilia in Trastevere, named after one of the wealthiest women in ancient Rome. One night, according to legend, her enemies locked her in her own steam room to sweat to death. But a mysterious dew, believed sent by divine intervention, kept her cool. She was eventually murdered, though, and is today one of the martyrs of the church. One of the most famous bridges crossing the Tiber is the Ponte Vittorio Emanuele, named for the first king of the Italian state. The Castel Sant'Angelo was built to house the tombs of the Emperor Hadrian and his family. Later, it became a fortress, then a prison, and for a time, the Papal Palace. The current Papal Palace is, of course, St. Peter's, the world's greatest church, immediately recognizable by its huge floating dome designed by Michelangelo. Each year, millions of the faithful come from every corner of the globe to visit the home of Roman Catholicism. The 100 or so acres on which St. Peter's sits is Vatican City, a separate state with its own government, post office, radio station, and newspaper. The famed Swiss guards are the Pope's personal security force. St. Peter's Square, designed and built by Bernini, is on the site of Nero's Circus, where Christ's disciple St. Peter, the first pope, was crucified. The colonnade, topped with 140 statues of saints, is shaped to represent the arms of the church, reaching out to embrace the world. The interior of the basilica is breathtaking.
Just inside is Michelangelo's masterpiece, the Pietà. It was attacked by a hammer-wielding madman in 1972 and is now enclosed in glass. It is not uncommon to find a priest celebrating mass in one of the many side chapels located off the nave. Although originally designed by Bramante, the famed dome of St. Peter's was raised and enlarged by Michelangelo, who carried out some of the work himself. The baldacchino, or canopy, over the high altar, where only the Pope can celebrate mass, is by Bernini. Under the altar is the confessio, where bronze vigil lamps flicker before the ceremonial entrance to the crypt and Vatican grottos. Above the main altar in the apse is the gilt bronze throne upon which sits the wooden and ivory chair of St. Peter. The throne is supported by carvings of different saints to the right of the main altar is the tomb that Pope Urban VIII ordered Bernini to create for him. Above the throne of St. Peter is a gilded bronze window that diffuses a golden light around a dove, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. At the rear of the church and surrounding the Vatican museums, are 58 acres of lush gardens that are carefully tended and filled with brilliantly colored flowers, groves of oak trees, and ancient fountains and pools. Probably the most famous of all Vatican treasures is the Sistine Chapel, where the frescoes present a marvelous procession of scenes from the life of Moses and Christ, and Michelangelo's ceiling with its wrathful and violent last judgment. The style of painting, which had never been seen before, started a whole new period in the history of art, the Baroque era. The most overwhelming panel, however, must be the creation. There are more than 300 churches in Rome. This is the Basilica of St. John Lateran, where in 896, the corpse of Pope Formosus, dressed in his papal vestments, was put on trial by his enemies for crowning a barbarian as emperor. He was propped up opposite his judge, Pope Stephen VI, found guilty and subsequently thrown into the Tiber. The Church of St. Peter in Chains is built on the site of the Roman law court where Peter was condemned to death under Nero. Today the church is best known for the superb statue of Moses by Michelangelo, which was intended to be part of a grandiose tomb for Pope Julius II in St. Peter's. It's said you can see Michelangelo's profile in a lock of Moses' beard. Under the main altar are chains believed to have bound St. Peter while he was in prison. Originally, there were two sets of chains, one from Jerusalem, the other from Rome but according to legend, they were miraculously joined together. The Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls was built by the Emperor Constantine to enclose the tomb of St. Paul, who is believed to have been beheaded nearby. The church has a beautiful cloister and gardens and features an exquisite 13th century Venetian mosaic. Another kind of mosaic is here in a Roman gelateria, which offers a mosaic of delicious flavors, mango, watermelon, pineapple. Okay. <laughs> 
As the afternoon fades, Rome's golden light begins to fill the sky. This is truly la dolce vita, the sweet life. And nowhere has it been more in evidence than along the famed Via Veneto. It has been a jet set hangout since the 1950s. The Via Veneto offers sidewalk cafes where fashionable couples enjoy a Campari and soda while watching the world go by. As evening falls, weary travelers trek back to their hotels to freshen up before starting out again into the magical Roman night. Rome is filled with world-famous hotels. Each one has its own history. The Hotel Quirinale, for example, is connected to the Opera House and has seen the great and near great of the music world pass through its doorway. Dopo la monarchia, eh, questo albergo è stato usato dalle, eh, dai maggiori artisti nel teatro dell'opera, soprano, tenori e direttori d'orchestra. Infatti eh, Giuseppe Verdi è stato qui, Maria Callas è stata qui, eh, ufficialmente, altri meno ufficialmente, però eh, i maggiori artisti del teatro dell'opera hanno eh, soggiornato al Quirinale, oppure se residenti a Roma o con abitazioni a Roma hanno utilizzato i servizi del Quirinale. Eventually it's time for dinner, beginning at 8 o'clock. Beautiful buffets can be found at four-star restaurants, but more simple food can be found in a trattoria, like pizza, for example. Perhaps the best way to enjoy a night in Rome is to stroll back to favorite sites and see how enchanting they become lit against the black Roman sky. But eventually, your time in Rome must come to an end. As you make your way back through the deserted streets, hoping the portiere will wake when you ring the bell of your hotel, you can think back over your visit to this magical city. Pope Gregory XIV addressed departing visitors in this manner. If they had spent less than three weeks in Rome, he bid them farewell. But if they had stayed several months, he would wish them until next time. After all, as the saying goes, Rome, a lifetime is not enough. <laughs>